morning, everyone. So we're going to continue into our energy chapter here. And today we're taking a look at machines. Machines in general, they let us use less force over longer distances to produce the same work. So the way I think about this here is I think about there's some task that you're trying to do. There's something that you're trying to accomplish. What the machine does is it allows you to do the same task with less force. The terminology that we're going to use is actually less effort. It's like you're actually supplying less newtons of force. The trade-off, however, is for you to accomplish the same amount of work, the same amount of joules that ta your task requires, you're actually going to need to apply that smaller effort over a longer distance. That's because when you look at the formula, work is given by force times distance. We're still trying to do the same objective. So maybe that could be lifting this box here from the ground into the truck here. But by applying a machine, what it allows me to do is it supplies me the ability to actually do it with less force, do it with less newtons. When I multiply it by bigger di distance, I manage to actually uh, do the same task. So below here is a picture of the six simple machines. These are six simple designs that uh, a lot of our uh, machinery is actually built off of. We've actually seen a little bit of this already. So starting off with the first one here with a ramp, or what's called the inclined plane, a plane that's put up at an angle theta. We've already seen this in chapter two. Instead of doing a deadlift, just sort of straight up off the ground, we saw that when we're on a ramp, although gravity doesn't care, gravity just pulls straight downwards anyways, if we're on a ramp and we're up by theta, we're actually not fighting all of gravity anymore, we're only fighting the downwards part of gravity. So therefore, the amount of force that I'm applying to try to push up the ramp is actually going to be less uh, than, say, deadlifting it just straight off the ground. So already, that machine is helping me decrease the amount of force. My effort is actually going to be a little bit less. Here's a sort of wedge design here, taking the axe and trying to chop this piece of wood. Uh, lever is also an example of a simple machine. Uh, so we have a fulcrum in the middle here. This is where your uh, board uh, rocks back and forth. Uh, unlike a teeter-totter, which is usually even on both sides here, for a useful lever, we typically want it to be longer on one side and shorter on the other. You're going to come back to this in Physics 12 and analyze this with something called torque. Uh, torque is this notion here. When I supply a force and it's supplied some distance away from your fulcrum, from your sort of center point here, that's going to cause a torque, that's going to cause a twisting motion that's actually going to change the amount of force on the other side here, which happens to be at a smaller lever arm. Right? So in our context for machines here, we're just going to compare how much I'm putting in and how much uh, I'm getting off of it. So that could be an example of a hammer here trying to lift this nail uh, off this wooden plank here. Another simple machi uh, machine design is a wheel and axle. So your cars, basically there's an axle, which is this rod here in the middle. Uh, the car engine will actually rotate this rod here in the middle. And by rotating this rod here, the diameter of the axle is a lot smaller than the diameter of the wheel. Somehow that force in the axle is transferred to the force on the outside to let your cars uh, actually move. Uh, the same sort of wheel and axle design is used for a, a doorknob uh, sort of design. Screw is also an example of a simple machine here. It could be a screw cap on a lid uh, that uh, plays off uh, the simple machine design there. And lastly here we have a pulley. So far in the diagram here, this is just a free hanging pulley. This string here as shown just redirects the force. It actually won't give us any what's called mechanical advantage. It doesn't actually decrease my force in any way. But for a pulley here, we can actually link one pulley to another pulley to another pulley. And by hooking up the strings here back and forth between pulleys, it can actually uh, end up maximizing my force, multiplying my force to actually accomplish the same task, but with the uh, less uh, effort. Evidently, if you look at the different types of machines, you're going to be given many different uh, styles of questions and different numbers. Uh, what we're trying to do in today's lesson here is just do a broad stroke. Uh, what are some things to keep in mind as we look at all types of machines? So we'll start off here taking a look here. We're going to learn not all input work, not everything you put in is converted to output work due to friction. Oops, due to friction. All right. So what's happening here is you're uh, putting in a certain amount of electricity. You're trying to do some tasks. That's what I'm going to be calling the work input. This is the amount of energy that you are delivering. This is the amount of uh, uh, tasks that you expect to be accomplished because you are putting in this many joules. 
turns out because of some losses due to friction, air resistance, heat, sound, uh, the amount of output work, the amount of uh, joules that you actually get out of useful energy is typically going to be less than this input work here. So this uh, work output here, you can think of this is useful, this is for the task at hand, this is what your machine does here. Obviously, you want this ratio to be as close to 1 as possible. Uh, we've actually introduced this ratio in an earlier lesson. This guy here is called efficiency. We're going to use the Greek letter eta. Efficiency as decimals is between 0 and 1 or it can be expressed in terms of a percent here, uh, because of uh, losses due to friction, your efficiency tends to be less than 1. Essentially, you're going to actually put in more energy if you subtract off what's lost the surroundings, what dissipates away, um, uh, we're going to be left with something that's less than that. So let's just do a quick uh, efficiency calculation here. Um, let's imagine we have a ramp style problem. So the ramp has our simple machine. We're going to start off with a 2 kilogram object and let's say the task at hand is to lift the 2 kilogram object off, uh, off the ground here by 4 meters. Uh, we can do that without the simple machine or we can do that with the simple machine of the ramp, 2 kilograms, without going through all the details. Let's just say uh, you actually need to supply an applied force of 15 newtons to get it off. We're going to do this uh, calculation twice. We're going to do the calculation with machine and without machine. Starting off with the typical case here, so assuming that we're all on the ground level here, we know that free body diagram, gravity pulls on this object here. Fg is equal to 2 times 9.8, which should be 19.6. Because I wasn't told otherwise, I'm going to assume constant velocity. Make things easy for yourself here. If we assume we're at a constant velocity, I at least need to apply a force exactly 19.6 Newton to actually go against it, to actually get it going. In fact, I need to pull harder than 19.6, but typically I just write equals 19.6. Uh, so the task at hand, so the work, is equal to force times distance. This is without machine. I'm supplying a force of 19.6 newtons. That's actually being applied over a distance of 4 meters. 19.6 uh, times it by 4. I'm trying to accomplish a task that's 78.4 joules worth, lifting this object up 4 meters off the ground. Now that's the case without the machine. Now you notice with the machine right off the bat, Instead of actually supplying 19.6, with the machine, I'm only supplying 15 newtons. So that would be uh, apply, this is how much you're pushing off of it, that would compensate for friction and going against downforce, that's all of that. We see that the uh, force that's done by the machine, your effort force is actually less. That's what I would expect to see in a machine. I'm not actually have to pull hard. But what's happening here is, even if we were in a perfect world, if I try to accomplish 78.4 joules worth of useful work, I need a supply I would expect over a longer distance. If I'm trying to get the same amount of work, uh, the smaller force, I would expect it to be a bigger distance. So let me just put down a number here. Let's say that distance here is 10. Again, we can make a comparison. Bigger distance here than we did before. So we're trading distance for uh, a little bit easier of a task. In fact, in this question here, when you actually try that out, so this is the same uh, equation, but with the machine, I go force times distance here. This time I'm applying 15 newtons, a little bit less effort, but supplying it over 10, I was supposed to get 150 joules worth of useful energy off of this. So this is with machine, and that one there is without, mach uh, without machine. If we were in a perfect world, if we were ideal and efficiency was one, if you actually do 150 joules of work, this box here was supposed to go 150 joules instead of 78.4. This box here should have actually been able to be left even farther off the ground. But due to this problem of efficiency here, what we're saying, efficiency is this ratio. We were actually inputting 150 joules worth of uh, useful work that was with the machine. We managed to only get 78.4 actually done because the box in both cases only got 4 meters off the ground. We can do that by ratio here. I go 78.4 divided by 150. It gives it to me as a decimal, but we can convert it to uh, percentage here. This is now 53% efficiency. Due to uh, heat losses in the environment, due to joules that are lost uh, with machine or without machine here, this was actually only able uh, to deliver 53% of what I actually put in. In a perfect world, again, this should have been 100%. This should have actually been able to be left higher off the ground, but my efficiency is actually a little bit lower. So efficiency is this nice ratio between uh, the different works. So uh, how much uh, without machine, how much with machine. 
Uh, another way of setting up this ratio here is actually quoting efficiency as a ratio of powers as well. If you remember, power is actually defined as the work divided by the time. So what can happen here is your efficiency can also be, well, how much power output, how much useful uh, power did I get out versus how much power am I putting in? Careful, I'm using P here, not as momentum this time. This is capital P for power. Uh, so let's just do a quick example of that one there. Uh, let's say I have a thousand kilogram object is lifted five meters in 12 seconds by a crane okay, that's quoted at 5 kilowatts. Right. So as always, I like starting off with a picture if we can here. We have our crane. It's deciding to lift up an object off the ground. The object, I'm told, is 1,000 kilograms, and I'm trying to lift it. Overall, the task needs to lift it here 5 meters, takes 12 seconds, and it's just going to be off the ground there. Again, we need to do a little bit of free body diagram stuff here. We have an FG. And FG is going to be 1,000 times 9.8. So that's going to equal to here um, 9,800. So that one there is Newton's. Again, we're going to assume that this was pulled at constant velocity. Keep things simple. That means your applied force similarly would have had to be 98,000. So this one here, I'm just doing a deadlift, trying to get it off the ground here. Let's calculate the work done first so that I can calculate power. The work is supposed to be force times distance. We need to supply at least 9,800. I supply it over 5 meters of distance, and I end up getting 9,800 times 5. I accomplish a task here of 49,000. Uh, Sorry, this one here is joules. Right? So that's my task. To calculate power, the task itself took 49,000, but how long did it take the crane to do this? We were told it took the crane on average 12 seconds. We can calculate what's the power uh, for my actual task, we're going to go work divided by time. My actual task was 49,000 joules divided by a time of uh, 12 seconds. This gives me my actual box was lifted up every second that passed by. I actually delivered 4083. Remember, for the unit for power is actually watts. I can write that down for you in words here. 4083 joules applied per second. So that watt symbol just means joule per second, right? So looking at the actual diagram, this is with or without machine, doesn't really matter, but I know I have a crane that's lifting it off. So my task is 49,000 joules. That's for lifting this box five meters off the ground. Because it took 12 seconds of time, I know every second I'm having to uh, pull a little bit harder than 4083. The crane itself was actually quoted at 5.0 kilowatts. This was my actual input. This is the amount that when I burned the gasoline to run the crane or uh, when I calculated my energy bill here, it told me I actually was delivering 5,000 joules for every second. In this case here, we can again set up this ratio. Efficiency is supposed to be the power, how much useful power did you get off of this out of how much uh, input power I got 4083 of useful wattage off the top there. I uh, put in a five kilowatt crane, so kilo is a thousand. So I put in 5,000. This again comes out as a decimal and then I'm gonna multiply it by 100. If you can keep the whole number in your calculator all the better, divided by 5,000. This gives me a little bit of better efficiency than before, 0.82. So we're looking at 82% efficient, right? So uh, we're basically saying uh, we're not in a perfect world. I'm delivering 5,000 joules, but I'm losing some 100 joules every second or so. Only 4083 of it is actually used for useful work. Right? So that's just efficiency in general. That sort of plagues us because we don't live in a perfect world. More so now as we uh, apply this efficiency concept to work, we're going to then have a look at the main term for machines. By designing a machine, we've already seen it uh, actually be able to decrease my effort force my machines actually provide something called a mechanical advantage. Okay? It's the machine that actually provides me some advantage. It allows me to use less effort uh, to accomplish the same task. Uh, so mechanical advantage, we're going to shorthand that here, MA. Uh, we're going to start off here, machines. They magnify force, allowing us to perform the same task, the same job, with less, and the emphasis here is with less effort. 
careful not to say uh, with less work because work actually talks about uh, the task that's at hand. We're accomplishing exactly the same task, but it just feels like it's easier. So it's less effort. Uh, again, I'm going to just emphasize, we already wrote this earlier. How do machines do this? Machines decrease. How does it feel easier? They decrease the input force. They decrease uh, the amount of effort that you're uh, supplying. But um, trade-off, okay? There's always some um, limitation. It's never a perfect world. So, but trade-off, uh, decreasing before, but trade-off, uh, increasing uh, the effort distance, right? the span that you actually supply your force for. Uh, and we're basically going to uh, calculate for you here uh, mechanical advantage. Right? So let's start off with a formula here. Let's assume we are in a perfect world first. So assume we have 100% efficiency. Right? So from the earlier formula, efficiency was supposed to be how much work that I'm getting out versus how much is in. In this assumption here, if efficiency is equal to 1, I can set this equal to 1. So therefore, I can have a work output is equal to a work input. We had two definitions for work versus force times distance or work exchange in energy because in these problems here, typically I'm given them in newtons and uh, meters. So I'm going to uh, just use that distance here. So I'm going to call the work output here. I'm going to call it force output times distance output equals the force input. Force input uh, times distance in. And essentially, I'm just going to collect the terms here. I'm going to collect the force that you managed to get out based on this ratio of force you get in is equal to the distance in divided by the distance out. And it's actually this ratio, force out over force in, right? This is the amount of uh, force that uh, you should have uh, been using. But this is the amount of effort that you're actually having to use. It should be something less. This one here is now going to be called your mechanical advantage. Right? I maximized the force there. I actually managed to get more newtons, um, uh, more newtons uh, of force, even though I only exert a little bit less. Right? So let's do a quick example just of this part of the formula. I'm going to return to this uh, formulation just a second here. So for mechanical advantage uh, style problem, uh, let's do a lever. So let's say I have a fulcrum here. I have a 50 kilogram block. It could have been on the ground, but I'm uh, using it to lift it off here. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, some distances here. Let's say this is a one meter distance. I mentioned for a lever, you typically want to uh, have it uh, different lengths on both sides. So the force would be different on both sides. Uh, you can calculate fairly easily with a free body diagram here. Just go 50 times 9.8. That one gives me here 490 Newtons. If I lift this object up off the ground, I would expect the 490 Newtons to be going upwards. Um, that's how much you're actually supplying. And let's say I'm actually, because this arm is a lot longer, it's going to supply more torque. Uh, again, you'll come back to that in physics 12. And let's say the effort force that I'm actually using, this is how hard I'm actually using. Effort force is just 75 Newtons. I always keep in the back of your mind, mechanical advantage should be bigger than one. Mechanical advantage should be my machine multiplies my force. So for this ratio here to be bigger than one, I need to go bigger number minus smaller number. So based on these numbers here, my mechanical advantage here, it's supposed to be how much uh, useful output work do I get out of it? Well, I got 490 uh, newtons of useful work, but I only put in 75 newtons. The machine allowed my force to be a little bit less. My effort is a little bit lower. 490 divided by 75 gives me a mechanical advantage, roughly give or take 6.5. It's magnified my force by 6.5. So that's what the machine has done. In decreasing the effort force for you here, it's actually managed to magnify um, times 6.5 your force without necessarily having to do anything. Because these ones here are all ratios, there's going to be no units for all of this. Okay, so no units for efficiency, no units for mechanical advantage, and just uh, getting used to some sort of lettering and some notation here. Um, usually we talk about sort of effort and uh, resistance force here. Uh, so typically uh, for the amount of uh, work uh, output that we're given, uh, typically you're going to call this. So if I have alpha output, a distance output here, you would typically call this FE or DE. 
And basically that would stand for here the effort force. So how much you're actually supplying the distance, uh, effort distance. Whereas on the other side here, when you have what you're inputting, this is the task at hand basically without the machine. This one here, typically you call it FR or DR, and this is just terminology wise, we call this the resistance force. And this one here is the uh, resistance distance. You can still keep to the in and out if it's uh, clear for you, but just uh, when they do this, they typically use this terminology uh, effort and resistance instead. All right. So that's what machines do for you. Machines allow us to actually um, uh, magnify our force. So you see in this problem, I only use 75 newtons, but it magnified my force uh, some 6.5 times. In this case here, this is a little interesting. On the left hand side, when you do F out equals F in, we were under the impression that efficiency was one. What if efficiency is not one? What if like earlier, we were still supplying forces, we were still trying to accomplish tasks, I was supplying this force, I was still uh, trying to accomplish this task here, but what if my efficiency is not one? What if it's not 100%? What would happen in this case here is when you try to do this formula, the sort of F out equals F in, when you're with friction, so F out divided by F in, when you're with friction, this is going to change. Okay, So this one here changes with friction. Right? So F out equals F in. The reason for that here is your task might still need a certain F in, but then because our efficiency, maybe it's a lower efficiency, I might need to actually supply even more force to actually accomplish a task. This part here might change if I have friction. But in our formula, when we had assumed 100% uh, efficiency, when I match this one here equals to d in equals d out, you notice that uh, it's opposite here, out over in, and this is in over out, your distances, however, don't change. So in this case here, your distance, whether we have friction or not friction here, doesn't matter. Distance in over distance out, this one here is always going to be a constant regardless of friction. And because it's regardless of friction here, we sometimes refer to this as an ideal mechanical advantage. Assuming a perfect world, maybe my forces were at such a ratio that it matches up with this one here. Um, this is how much mechanical advantage uh, the machine should have given me. So ideal mechanical advantage, they usually just say IMA for that there. And ideal mechanical advantage is the mechanical advantage if no friction, is the mechanical advantage if we assume that there were no uh, losses. Uh, you can verify for yourself here. Uh, efficiency, we've been seeing as a bunch of ratios. So far we've seen it's the amount of useful work compared to input work. It's the amount of useful power compared to um, power input here. Shouldn't surprise you then. It's my real mechanical advantage, assuming all the friction comes into play, divided by your IMA uh, compared to your uh, ideal mechanical advantage and your ideal mechanical advantage depending on the simple machine is given differently but at least based on our formula it's given by uh, d in uh, over d out. Uh, so let's just try a quick question here with this idea of mechanical advantage. Again, this is a broad stroke. You're going to actually look into these machines in a little more detail to actually figure out uh, what sort of information they might give you. So let's just end off with this question here. I'll give you a worksheet with uh, some more uh, styles of these problems. Let's start off with a 15 kilogram crate attached to a pulley. Attached to a pulley. So that's the setup. So maybe we can hook it on the ceiling here. I attach a 15 kilogram crate on this pulley. Uh, I'm told in terms of my, after my machine, a 95 Newton force acting over 20 centimeters is required to lift uh, this 15 kilogram crate 10 centimeters in the air. Question here is determine the mechanical advantage, determine the ideal mechanical advantage, and therefore by ratio you can calculate the efficiency. All right. uh, so here's the picture here. The actual task at hand, 15 kilograms, the actual task, this object here is only being lifted off uh, 10 centimeters. 
when I supply a 95 Newton force, so 95 Newtons is sort of supplied on the pulley, it's like the string, the cable itself is actually being stretched. Again, there's that notion of longer distance. I'm applying less effort but longer distance to accomplish the same task. I want to calculate here, can we do mechanical advantage? Can we do uh, ideal so that we can calculate efficiency? As always with these sort of lifting problems here, let's just start off with the force of gravity. Force of gravity is equal to 15 times 9.8. So 15 times 9.8 gives me here 147. Again, assuming that there's um, constant velocity, you're actually going to be lifting it up off the same FA of 147. So that's sort of my, um, without the pulley, I needed a supply of 147. Uh, in this section, it's really easy to get confused with output and input. Uh, so therefore, sometimes we like transitioning over to, is it effort, is it distance? So that way you can see uh, which numbers should be multiplied and whatnot. Uh, in this case here, just looking at the numbers, I see that between my forces, my FA is bigger than my F uh, effort. So let's call this one here the effort force. So therefore, this one here is now called the effort distance. Uh, this one here is going to be a resistance force. This is almost as if the pulley wasn't there, resistance force. And then this is called the resistance distance. I don't memorize the formula. I would just start off here, uh, well, mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage is supposed to be uh, F. Uh, earlier we had put F output over F input. Again, it's a little bit confusing. Well, is effort or is resistance going to be output or input? I just think of it, mechanical advantage should be bigger than one. So in this case here, for it to be bigger than one, we're actually taking our resistance force. Our resistance force is actually uh, 147 divided by 95. How much is my machine actually magnifying my force? 147 divided by 95 gives me here a mechanical advantage of 1.55. Uh, so it's magnifying my force. Uh, keep in mind the machine should be helping you. There's no point in engineering machine that actually uh, um, divides your force, so it magnifies your force. In that case there, that could be due to uh, some friction problems. I may not be 100% efficiency. That's what I meant earlier by this F out over F in ratio might change due to friction. Let's calculate the D in over D out. Remember, this had assumed 100% efficient. Ideal mechanical advantage compares the distances instead. Ideal mechanical advantage here, careful in our formulation, it was D in equals to D out. Again, it's going to be a little bit confusing which is out and which is in. But based on what we said, the output is going to be the resistance. So here we go. The D in is my effort distance. My effort distance was I pulled it up by 20 centimeters. Technically, you should have actually converted that to meters, but because both are centimeters, we're fine. We pulled it a longer distance of 20 centimeters. The resistance was only supposed to be 10 centimeters worth. Your ideal mechanical advantage is two. So this pulley system was supposed to give me uh, magnifying a force of two, but because of uh, uh, friction losses, my mechanical advantage is actually less than two. So uh, long story short here, we're going to go efficiency. We're going to take our MA divided by our IMA. 1.55 is what I'm getting. Divided by 2 gives me this ratio here. 1.55 divided by 2 gives me 0 0.775, or we can round that here, 78%. So that's how we deal with this question here. I know that our formulas were derived as if uh, efficiency was 100%. In fact, in a lot of your worksheets, I would encourage you to start there. I would start off with efficiency is uh, work output over work input. If you're given an actual efficiency number here, put that number here. And we're going to just uh, finish off here. So work input is going to be the effort force times the effort distance. And then over here, resistance force and the resistance uh, distance. So uh, hopefully that'll help you in practicing your worksheets there. Uh, and if you have any questions, just let us know. Thanks, guys.